Revelation 19. If you'll remember, last week we looked at the reaction that the world, those that were left after the rapture, had to the falling of Babylon the Great. Okay. This week, we're going to read a couple of verses from 19. We're not going to be able to get all the way through it. But we're going to see heaven's reaction to the falling of Babylon the Great. Okay, Revelation chapter number 19. We're going to start verse number 1. The Bible says, And after these things, well, what were these things? The fall of Babylon. I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, we start off in verse number 1, and we see before John can even process what it is that he just saw with the world weeping, you remember there were the merchants, you remember there were the shippers and the traders, everyone was mourning, right? They were grieved at the fact that Babylon had gone. Why? Because that was their livelihood. That's the horse that they had hitched their cart to. But then, before he can even get out of describing what the world's reaction was, in verse number 1, he said, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Nowadays we say, Hallelujah. Same thing. But that word, if you break it down, it truly means glory to God. Right? The very first thing that heaven says is, God needs glory for what just happened. You see why? He says, Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now, something you might want to pay attention to here. We know that words should be capitalized at the beginning of a sentence. Okay? Hallelujah is capitalized. Then there's a semicolon. And then there is salvation with a capital letter S. Right? Salvation is a thing. Right? We can be saved, those that were lost. Right? But here, this is a name. Capital S, salvation. Right? Well, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he counselor? Isn't he the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace? Well, he also is salvation. Our salvation is not only in Christ. He is salvation. Right? The entirety of the plan that was laid before the foundation of the world was that Christ would become salvation. Do you think that it's any wonder that he said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Why? Because he's salvation. But notice, glory, honor, power, not capitalized. Then, Lord and God are capitalized. Right? It's giving praise, not just for the destruction of Babylon. They're saying, hallelujah. Right? Finally, the one that deserved her just reward, received her just reward. But then, they don't start off with glory and power and honor. No, they say salvation. Why is that the first thing that heaven, right after they say glory to God, why is salvation the first thing that comes to mind? 
because by you know, but for the grace of God, they would have been included in the crowd that's still on the earth. They start off saying glory to God, and then as they go to expound upon the glory that they wish to give to God, they start with salvation. They say, Lord, thank you for me being able to hear what it was that it took to have my sins forgiven. Heaven's first reaction after seeing destruction is, Lord, thank you for my deliverance. Then, the next thing that they bring up, glory. He does deserve glory. Not just glory from our lips in praise. All glory is His. Right? His glory is something so magnificent and so wonderful that God used it as a reward for Moses to see. Moses desired to see him face to face, but God said, you can't do that or else you're going to die. Flesh cannot see me and live. But he says, but I will let you see my glory. Right? So often people are chasing after being in the presence of God's glory. Right? Every now and then he shows out around here, what happens? The glory just falls. Right? It's akin to when the smoke filled the temple. You don't know what to do. You just got to get out of there because you know whatever that is, it's too great, it's too high, it's too mighty for us. But so often people chase his glory and not his person. They're magnifying God's glory because of his salvation. Salvation is the person of God. It is the person of Christ. In order to be saved, you must receive Christ. You can't get salvation without Christ. But because of your relationship with Christ, you can enjoy the glory of God. They start with salvation because that's the only reason they know anything about the glory of God. Then they go on to enumerate the glory of God, which is a wonderful thing to be a partaker or just to witness the glory of God is a rare thing. And they say, He does deserve all glory. But then, they go on to say, and honor. Glory is the beautification of something. Right? Doesn't the Bible say that a woman's hair is her glory? Right? She can take that and it is a crown under her right it's a gift of God that she could be arrayed with that hair right well the glory of God is just his magnificent made evident but do you know why he is full of glory it's because of his honor it is his honor that makes him God but he is worthy of all honor or reverence for man here they're not saying that we're adding to God's righteousness or His holiness. No, they're saying we reverence Him because He is honorable. He is altogether lovely. He is perfect. He's without spot and without blemish. But here they're reverencing. That's the honor that they're talking about. They're saying God deserves all worship. God deserves all devotion. God deserves everything that the world gave to Babylon, but it should have been His all along. And He says, And power unto the Lord our God. Now, we can't give God any power. He is all-powerful. We're going to read it a few verses down here later. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. You know what omnipotent means? He has all power. We know that we have our being because of the power of God. By Him and through Him do all things consist. We can go read John 1. Without Him was nothing made. Right? All power belongs to God. So why here is heaven saying, we give all power unto God? Right? Right before this we saw reverence and saying we're giving our devotion unto God. When they say all power unto God, that's them yielding themselves unto God. The only power that God cannot wield is the one that you won't let Him use. He has all power. He can make you do it. 
But he chooses that he only uses those that yield themselves to his hand. When they go back and they say, all, all glory, all honor, all power unto God, they're saying, Lord, everything that I've got, it belongs to you. Not just all the finery, the glory that you've blessed me with. The blessings of God are the glory of His saints. The treasures truly that Christians hold on to don't come from this world. We glory in those things that God hath bestowed upon us spiritually. It's that gold, silver, and precious gems that we've laid up in heaven. That's what's precious to us so that when God rewards us for our deeds in this body, we lay them down at His feet and say, Lord, these are the most precious things that I have and they belong to You. I did it because I love You. Honor. Are we not to be vessels of honor? Our life should bring honor unto the Lord. All the honor that I have, it may not be much. Right? I'm just an earthen vessel that God put His great presence of the Holy Ghost and He bought it with the blood of His Son. I'm just a dirt pot. But all the honor that I can bring to the name of God, I'm going to be reverential and devoted unto Him. But then it says all power. Lord, with every breath that I have, with every step that I can take, with every thought that this brain that you gave me can come up with, I want my member, right, this tabernacle that you've chosen to indwell, I want it to be used and give all power that I have unto you so that you can do something with my feeble efforts. I know that the arm of flesh is going to fail me. I know that anything I do of myself is doomed to fail. Except the Lord build the house, it cannot stand. So Lord, I yield all of my power to your direction. God could write it in the sky. God could use angels to do His work here down on earth. But no, He chose to use people. So they say, Lord, everything that I am, it's yours. Because you are, capital S, my salvation. Because of salvation, Lord, I give everything that I have unto you. All that I'm capable of, all that I'm able to amass, it belongs to you. Hook, line, and sinker. Because that's how God gave salvation unto you. You got all of Christ. He withheld nothing. He bestowed upon you the fullness of His Son in order for you to receive the new creature in order for you to become a child of God. But then it says, verse number 2, this tells you why He's worthy of all them things. One, because He's God. But two, we get a little bit of explanation of who God is. It says, for true and righteous are His judgments. He'd never been wrong. All of His judgments are true. But then it says, and righteous. Some people judge correctly, but then they don't mete out the judgment righteously. But he say, those are the people that they say, well, you're guilty, but we're going to suspend the sentence. You're guilty of what you did, but instead of what the law says you should be punished with, we're going to give you something different. God's never made a judgment that he didn't carry through with righteousness. Is it any wonder that God is long-suffering towards us, that He did not judge us in our sins. He waited for us to receive salvation before we go to the judgment seat. God gave everyone an opportunity to escape His judgment. Why? Because His judgment is righteous. You know what that means? It means that there's no loopholes. It means that there's no escape. His judgments are true, but they're also righteous. That's why so many people don't understand, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Just because God doesn't strike the world down today with judgment doesn't mean that it's not coming. And when it does come, it will be true and it'll be righteous. He utterly destroyed the great whore of Babylon. And what was his judgment? Nothing was left. 
The only thing that was left was the smoke, as we read, that rose up even to the heavens. That's how great her destruction was. But it says, For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. They are praising and giving honor to God because he destroyed the one, not the only one, but destroyed one that had a great hand in damning so many, whole, or so many souls to hell. It says she corrupted the very earth with her fornication. Right? It didn't say that she corrupted a land or a people or a section of the world. No, it says the whole earth. The philosophy of Babylon is why so many people today are deceived with a lie and believe it and will take it to her, their grave. It's because she intermingled and fornicated with so many, pe so many different nations and people and as a result, they were robbed Right? She had all the finery in the world. They were fleeced. But then, in all of eternity, they'll be forgotten to God. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. Right? The greatest spiritual criminal that has ever walked the earth in flesh was put to judgment. And, heaven says, he hath judged the great whore, who not just corrupted the earth with her fornication, hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. She's the greatest enemy of the church that's made flesh. We know that Satan's our adversary. We know that he is our enemy. But who does Satan use? People, just like God uses people. She was made flesh, the desire of Satan to destroy the saints. And God avenged those things. Right? Her blood was required as payment for the sins that she had committed. And then it says, verse number 3, And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. I don't know about you, but that sounds like eternity. In eternity future, there will be a pillar of smoke as a reminder that God did not forget those that paid the ultimate price for His Son. There will be a reminder that God dealt justly with the one that corrupted the earth. And there will be a reminder that the one who meant to replace God on earth could not stand the fierceness and the wrath of God. And for all of eternity, when people see it, they'll say, Hallelujah. God deserves glory. Right, well, verse number 4, it says, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we know that Hallelujah means glory to God. If you don't know this, the word Amen means either you agree or so be it. They bow down, they say, Lord, they did a pretty good job praising you. We agree with them. Hallelujah. Well, verse number five. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. See, verse number one. Sounds a whole lot like praise to me. Verse number two was praising his acts, right? His works. Okay, well, then we get down to verse number five. Voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. That wasn't spoken to the people that were in heaven that day. That was spoken to you so that when you read this, you can give praise to God for things that haven't even happened yet. Realize that? Too many times we're defeated with where we're at now. It changed your demeanor and the way that you look at life as you start praising Him for where you're going to be. Doesn't matter where you are now, the end's been told. Right? Yeah, we still have to contest. Right? Uh, 
battle, to wrestle with those spiritual, with spiritual wickedness in high places. Right? Every now and then it's against flesh and blood, but it's against the factors behind the scenes that are pushing those people to do those things. You're in a war, the Bible describes it. Every day you're in spiritual warfare against your flesh, against the world, against those that are around you. Instead of focusing on where you're at, praise the Lord for what He's promised He'll already do. Praise Him for where you're going to be. Right? Yeah, the valley's hard, I get it. But we're headed to the mountaintop of all mountaintops. Right? As one songwriter wrote, it'll be worth it after all. Right? Every mile's been worth it. Every second mile that I've given Him, it's worth it. It'll all be worth it when, when we see His face. Right? Praise Him for where you will be. Then it says, verse number 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That statement's just as true now as it will be on the day that we all say it in heaven. Again, hallelujah, glory to God. For the Lord God, again, both capitalized. He's not just God, He's also Lord. Omnipotent, reigneth. It'd be one thing if He had all power and didn't exercise it. No, God reigns. He's in control. Even now, at this very second, Satan can't do a single thing unless God permits it. Not one person across the globe comes to a position of power unless God ordained it to be so to accomplish some aspect of His will. Not one thing since God said, let there be light in Genesis chapter number 1 has ever gone unaccording to God's plan. Not one thing has ever happened that God didn't permit it for some reason. When you realize that, that should bring a hallelujah to your lips. Everything in your life is orchestrated by God for a purpose. Maybe not your purpose, but certainly for God's purpose. We know that His ways are above our ways. We know that His ways are past finding out. We can't always explain why God does something on this side of glory, but these people in heaven after they've already been judged, right? They've gone to the judgment seat of Christ by this point. I'll show you why here in a couple of verses. But after seeing God's great plan, you know what their decision or what their conclusion was? Hallelujah. God had it all in control all along. God hasn't taken one fraction of a second off from reigning and ruling over his creation since the very beginning. Right? That should be an encouragement to us. That should give a little bit of gumption to us. Right? We're not serving a dead Jew. We're serving the all-powerful, all-holy, all-honorable God of heaven. And it's not that one day he will be in charge. He's always been in charge. And he's not just in charge and struggling to keep things together. No, 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 no. He's omnipotent. He has all power. Well, then it says, verse number 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Not just, we've already seen why he deserved honor for what he did to Babylon. This is something different. They said, hey, just in case that wasn't enough to glory God and honor God over, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. Now here in this verse, we get what's referred to as the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's that? That's when the bride of Christ will be married to the one that bought her. Well, who's the bride of Christ? That's the church, the one that He paid for with His very blood. And what's the marriage supper? That's where everything that separated them in flesh and in spirit, and that's been done away with. And now, 
Christ and the church shall be united for all of eternity. Now this verse is why I can say that the judgment seat of Christ has already happened. You see at the end of it where it says, and his wife hath made herself ready. You don't get to the marriage supper without being purified by God's judgment. In order to make yourself ready for the supper and for the marriage with Christ, you have to receive an account or give an account of the deeds that you did in your body after you joined the bride or the church. What was that? When you got saved. But she hath made herself ready. You don't get that fine twine linen. You don't get that marriage garment without giving an account to God for the deeds that you did after you were saved. So when it says she hath made herself ready, verse number 8, and to her was granted that day. Right? Not when we get called out of here on the rapture. No, on the day of the marriage. It says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We have no righteousness of our own. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. Where's this righteousness of the saints coming? That's after what we get that glorified body. That's after we become like Him. The thing that we have aspired for since we received salvation. All those things that separated us in spirit and in body and flesh and mind, all done away with. And as a token or a symbol that we finally have received the righteousness that Christ always intended for us, we are arrayed in that fine white garment, right? that pure garment, the one without spot and without blemish. Right? This garment symbolizes that we are like the Lamb, capital L, from the verse before this, that was selected to be our sacrifice. How many times did the prophet say that he would be a lamb without spot and without blemish? Right? Well, on that day, we're going to start looking like what? The lamb. On that day, we have an outer testimony of the fact that because of what he did, we were made like him. Are we him? No. But on that day, we'll be like him. Well, how can he say that? Well, I don't, you know, the Bible, right, said, and we shall see him. Don't know what we shall be, but I know that we'll see. Well, does that mean we got to be like him in order to see him? Flesh cannot see him and live. On this day, this garment, it doesn't speak to our holiness, because only God is holy. It speaks to our righteousness that we are no longer crippled and burdened with what? Sin. That we have become the final product of what the Father envisioned for His Son. A father doesn't let a son get married if the bride isn't up to his standards. A father doesn't go through and pay for a wedding, right, and for a supper in his house. Where's all this happening? It's happening in glory. God the Father's laid out the spread as a celebration for the fact that His Son finally gets to be united with His bride. That doesn't happen if the bride doesn't meet God's seal of approval. This fine white garment is a testament and a testimony to the fact that you meet God's standard of approval for His Son on that day. Now on today, we may not meet that approval outwardly. But one day, the thing that God put in us is going to catch up with where God intends us to be. And on that day, we will, in the eyes of God, be worthy of His Son. And at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we'll celebrate the fact that the marriage happened. That we're joined together never to be separated. It's on that day that we receive the fullness, right, the completed work of your salvation. The work of salvation was not you getting forgiven for your sin. That was one of the benefits. 
But the work of salvation was to unite you with Christ for all of eternity. That by one son, many children could come to the Father. And that, the only thing that was predestined in your Bible, study it out, is that those that receive the Son should be conformed to His image. Well, on that day will be the striking image of the Son of God. And on that day, we get into the family of God through marriage. We already received the birth, right? That happened when you got saved. We've received the adoption of sonship whereby we crawl, cry, Abba, Father. But on that day, we get married into the family. That's the final act of three ways making you a child of God. So it is, is, it, is it any wonder that in verse number 7 he starts with, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him? Why? Because there's a day coming. We're not just in spirit. Right? Not with promises from the Word of God, but made full fruition. You'll be able to see it, touch it, experience it as if you're looking at me right now. You'll be able to enjoy your membership in the family of God to its fullness. Rejoice and be glad and give honor to God that that day's coming. He'd have been justified to cast us off into hell for things we've done after we got saved. But the day that you accepted Christ, there's a place in heaven with your name at the table and with a dinner plate with all the fixings. He's got a robe for you already just waiting. It's the perfect size. He had it tailored just to you. Right? Praise and glory unto God because of what's waiting for us on the other side. Then in verse number 9, he says, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah, without a doubt. So he says, and he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, between verse number 8 and verse number 9, I don't know who's talking. We know that somebody's talking to John. It says, and he saith unto me. But who is he? We don't know. We just know that there was somebody that looked over at John and said, hey, write this down. Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he said, he says, then he kept on talking. These are the true sayings of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was talking to somebody and I was talking about myself, I wouldn't have said these are the true and faithful sayings of Jordan. Right? That's third person. Anytime that God says something in the Bible, He says, I said it. And that's enough. Why? Because He's God. We've already been over that. He's all powerful. He deserves all glory and all honor. We've been there. God's God. When Jesus was here, He would say, my Father is saved. Right? The apostles later came and said that the Son said. Well, here it says these are true sayings of God. Well, whoever is saying this looks a whole lot like God. Why do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because of verse number 10. Because John said, and I fell at his feet to worship him. Hang on a second. This is John the Revelator. That means that he's the John that was the brother of James, the son of Zebedee. This is one of Peter, James, and John that got to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the John that every chance that he got, he's got his head laying on the bosom of Christ. This is the John when 11 others said, Lord, is it I that will betray you? They said, John, you ask him. He'll tell you. And he said, Lord, who is it? He knew that he wouldn't betray God. He never once said, Lord, am I going to be the one to betray you? Because he knew he couldn't. He loved him too much. This is that John. 
Right? This is the John that even though he's been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, on, Sunday, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, he's in the Spirit having himself a fit worshiping God, and God calls him up to glory. The very first thing that he hears is Jesus, the one in between the candlesticks, right? The one that is God talking to him. He says, write seven letters to these seven churches. John knows what Jesus looks like. John knows what God looks like because he's been in glory for a while. But in verse number 9, this fellow that's talking to him, twice he says, and he said unto me, but it's not a capital H. It's a lowercase h. It doesn't say, and God said unto me. John figured out afterwards that this wasn't Jesus. But this is John. John don't bow down and worship anybody that's not God. John on an island and exiled because he would not recant the name of Jesus. John's had all of his apostle buddies martyred because they would not recant the name of Jesus. The world has done everything that they possibly can to John to shut him up and to get him to stop preaching the name of Jesus. And yet, on that Lord's Day, on the Isle of Patmos, what's he doing? He's worshiping God. John knows who God is. Then why does he bow down and why does he start? You know, he didn't get to it, but he says, I went to go start worshiping the guy that told me this. That's because whoever this person was, they're telling him. Look at verse number 9 again. Right, blessed are they which are called under the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is somebody that's already been to the marriage and is telling John after the fact, hey, write down that if you get to go to the marriage, it's worth it. Well, if they've already been to the marriage, guess what? They've got that fine twine linen. Right? They've got that pure garment. They've already been through the judgment seat of Christ. You know what they have? They have a body that looks just like Christ. After the marriage supper, we all look like Christ. And wouldn't it just be God to let John in glory tell John on the Isle of Patmos, hey, write down, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true sayings of God. Right? And John looks at it and says, that's Jesus. No, it wasn't Jesus, but he looked like Jesus. One day, there's coming a day that they, John himself, who knew Christ in the flesh, wasn't able to tell the difference between Christ and one that had gone to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a day coming where people won't be able to distinguish between Christ and you, other than the fact that Christ is the one sitting on the throne in the middle of that city where he is the light of the city. We'll get to that here in a couple of chapters. But there's coming a day that if you were to stand right next to Christ, God can't tell the difference. You say, why is that, Brother Jordan? Because that's what He's always desired for you. God knows who the Lamb is, but He wanted you to be just like the Lamb. And there's coming a day that that will will be performed. And this person, whoever's talking to John, they just went to the marriage supper. They went through the marriage process. And on the other side of it, they said, write down, blessed are they that get an invitation. Well, the truth is, is that everyone that was ever lost has had an invitation. But when he's saying, doesn't just say invitation, he says that are called. Everybody had an invitation. You know who gets a call to the table? Those that accepted the invitation. He's saying, blessed are those that were saved, and one day God's going to call them out of earth. Then they're going to have to go through the judgment seat of Christ, which we talked about many weeks ago now. And after that, they're given fine garments. And the marriage to the Lamb happens. And he says, after going through it, I can tell you one thing. Those people are blessed. Well... Verse number 10 says, Then I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not? 
He says, I'm not Christ. The person who's talking knows that he's not God. But John didn't. Why? Because he looked just like him. He says, I am thy fellow servant. That's why if any of y'all have ever read, it drives me nuts every week. But if any of y'all have ever read one of the devotions I've done for the church app, I always sign it, your fellow servant in Christ. Because that's what we are. We're family, but we're a family of servants. And we serve alongside one another. He looks at John and he says, dude, I'm the lowest of the low. I'm just a servant. I'm your fellow servant. He says, you and me are the same. In that moment, John realized, one of these days, I'm going to look like that guy. And that guy looks like God. He says, I am thy fellow servant and of of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. He says, the only reason I look like this is because I got saved and I just went through everything that you just saw. He says, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now we could really dig real deep into that. But here's what it boils down to. What's a testimony? That's the outward works that are done. Well, what's Jesus' testimony? Everything that he's ever done in somebody's life. Not just what he lived here for some 33 and a half years. His testimony is what he's done from glory in the lives of people since he went back home. His testimony is what you allow him to do by saying all power unto God and yielding your life unto him. But it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, what is prophecy? That you get a piece of it here, a promise. Just a tiny bit. What God says, I'll do this, but the rest of it's hid behind that veil that we can't see because of our sin-cursed eyes. That we can't understand because of our sin-cursed mind. And we have to trust that one day it will come true because God said it. Well, this guy that's just been talking to John said, this is true because they're the words of God. Blessed are they which are called to the supper, to the marriage. He said, and it's true because God said it. Then we get down here. Well, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I don't know what you got to go through between now and then, but you're going to be blessed. You're blessed now. Because God sees you as if you're already there. John saw you at the marriage. He's already seen the marriage. If you're saved, John has seen you wearing the robe that God had made for you. For all I know, you may have been the one that looked at John and said, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage of the Lamb. We don't know who said it. We just know that whoever said it, they looked a whole lot like Jesus. The prophecy of the Bible is that God gives you a little, and then He tells you to exercise that thing that He gave you, a measure of faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. It's true. You're blessed beyond measure. You you can't comprehend on this side of heaven how blessed you're going to be. But the testimony of Christ is that He's done enough already for us to see that He means what He says. Did He not save you when He promised that He would? Did He not make you into a new creature? Did He not bring forth the fruits of the Spirit in your life? Did He not change you from what you once were into a disciple, right? A representation of what His message is to the world. Did He not give you a place in the church where He fitly framed you together to where you would have a place just for you among His people? Has He not done everything that He's promised? So just take it on a little bit of faith that you're blessed beyond measure if you're receiving a call to the marriage supper. But we have much to praise and be able to glory over God this morning, regardless of where we are, because of where we one day will be. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? 
head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.